Good day, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on Network Hardening Techniques, Part 3. Today I'm going to discuss user authentication, and then I'm going to talk about some authentication and authorization methods. There's a fair amount of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and dive into this session. Of course, I'm going to start by talking about user authentication. Hardening the network will not do you any good if there is poor authentication of the users and devices that are allowed on the network. The process of proving that you are who you say you are, if you are a person, or that you are what you say you are, if it's a device, is called authentication. Authentication is different than authorization. Authorization is what you are allowed to do after you have been authenticated. There are several different ways in which users can be authenticated and there are several different methods in which authentication can be implemented. Let's talk about basic authentication of the user. There are three basic factors for authenticating users. There's by what you know. This is the user and password method. By what you are. This is commonly implemented through biometrics. And finally, there is by what you have. This is commonly implemented through the use of security tokens. These are the three basic factors for authenticating users. Now you can combine these in a process that's called multi-factor authentication. That's requiring the use of more than one of the factors of authentication, as in requiring a password and a fingerprint scan, or the code from a security token and a password. Those are multi-factor authentication. Now multi-factor authentication is used to increase the security of the authentication process. You might also implement a single sign-on process. It's a process in which the user only has to provide authentication once via a single smart device rather than having to authenticate for each and every network resource that they request. So let's talk about authentication and authorization methods. The first method we're going to talk about is PAP, Password Authentication Protocol. When logging into a network resource, the user or device is required to supply a username and password. The username and password are sent in clear text format, so this method is considered unsecure and should only be used as a last resort. More secure than PAP is CHAP, Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. It is similar to PAP in that when logging into a network resource, the user or device is challenged to supply a username and secret password, and it authenticates through a three-way handshake process. The way it works, the resource issues a challenge. It wants to know the hashed value of the username and secret password. The user's device sends the hashed value to the resource device. The resource evaluates the hashed value and either accepts or rejects the connection. By using CHAP, the username and password are never sent in clear text. It's much more secure than PAP. There's also MS CHAP. It's functionally the same as Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol but it is Microsoft's proprietary implementation of it. You might also implement one of the forms of Extensible Authentication Protocol, or EAP. It's not a single protocol on its own, but a set of additional authentication methods used by remote access clients. Currently, there are more than 100 different methods defined by the EAP specifications. One of the more popular is Kerberos. So let's talk about Kerberos. It's an authentication protocol which uses TCP or UDP port 88 by default. It's a system of authentication and authorization that works well in environments that have a lot of clients. The main component of Kerberos is the Key Distribution Center, or the KDC. The KDC has two parts, the Authentication Server, or AS, and the Ticket Granting Service, or TGS. Here's how it works. 
when a user logs in, a hashed value of his or her username and password is sent to the authentication server. If the AS likes the hash, it responds with a ticket granting ticket and a timestamp. So it will respond with a TGT that also has a timestamp. The client then sends the TGT with the timestamp to the ticket granting service, the TGS. The TGS then responds with a service ticket, which can also be called an access token or just a token. The service ticket authorizes the user to access specific resources on that network. As long as the TGT is still valid, the TGS will grant additional authorization by issuing a new service ticket as required for as long as the TGT and its timestamp are still valid. Now that concludes this session on Network Hardening Techniques Part 3. I talked about user authentication, and then we concluded by talking about authentication and authorization methods. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session, and I trust I'll do another one soon.